much uh, for your grace which saves. Thank you, God, for your grace which sustains. And now, God, as we come to stand as we, uh, as earthen vessels, attempt to share the wonderful riches of Christ our King. God, we pause again to thank you for your grace that has redeemed us and bought us with Christ. We thank you, God, for the call to Christian service and for the grace that gives us strength and the strength to stand and to serve. Now, God, we pray both for proclaimer and for hearer. For we know, God, that in the worship experience that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of the Lord. And so, God, we pray, God, as we preach Jesus, that Holy Spirit whom he promised would have certainly help to illuminate the word of God. We might not only understand for salvation, those who are redeemed might grow in grace and in knowledge of you. So, God, we thank you. We thank you for the gift of life on today. Father, we know it was not our alarm clocks that woke us up, but it was by your grace and your mercy. And God, we not only thank you for the gift of life, but we thank you most of all for the gift of eternal life. The word says, what does it profit us to gain the whole wide world? Turn around and lose our soul. And so God, we thank you, we honor you, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, let the church say amen. amen. I'll run around bring you my glasses. That might help you. <laughs> Amen. I'm going to call us to the 14th uh, chapter of John. Uh, as you remember on last week, I said that we were finishing uh, our series. And so I'm going to call us uh, today to John's Gospel, uh, the 14th chapter. During that 14th chapter, what we are seeing here, we're seeing the disciples um, ask a number of questions, or actually Philip asked some questions on behalf of the disciples. Um, and they're looking for answers to come from Jesus, right? And so you'll notice in John 14, I just want to read verse 6, but I was trying to give us the context of what we're dealing with. Again, we have Philip asking questions, or Thomas, excuse me, asking questions. Later on, Philip does the same. Uh, of Jesus on behalf of all the disciples. And Jesus uh, gives a response to their question in verse 6. Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You may be seated. Now, what I want to talk about today uh, is, is answering questions about Jesus. We'll talk about answering questions about Jesus. Uh, Rabbi, Rabbi Zacharias is a prolific apologist uh, from India, converted to Christianity from Hinduism. Uh, Rabbi Zacharias says that we need to understand that whenever we are answering a question, and more specifically questions about Jesus, we need to understand that we're doing more than simply answering a question. We are responding to a questioner. Let me say it again. Whenever we answer a question, we're not only answering a question, we're responding to a questioner. And that questioner is somebody who is on a quest. Somebody who's on a quest for knowledge. It doesn't matter whether it's in a classroom, whether it's in our homes. Uh, anyone that asks another human being a question, they by definition are a questioner, but they are also on a quest. And so when we look at all the questions that are being asked, that are being bannered around, uh, the most important question is, what will we do with Jesus? Who is Jesus? And so uh, the disciples here in the text uh, Jesus, it, they've been with Jesus uh, from, for about three, three and a half years. Uh, now Jesus is telling them, listen, I'm going to have to go away. That they immediately began to experience separation anxiety. Separation anxiety is in the form of grief, right? 
We often read this text at funerals. It's appropriate to read because they were dealing with separation anxiety. Jesus said, I'm getting ready to go away. And so they were going to have time to really have to process this. And they said, Jesus, we're struggling with the fact that you're getting ready to leave us. What are we going to do? Jesus said, calm down. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house will be the If I were not told you, listen, I'm going away to prepare a place. Thomas raised his hand. You know, there's always somebody that wants to raise their hand and ask a question. Now, that person has courage. Because educators will often tell you no question is ever a stupid question. Because if there are 30 students in the class, and there are 29 others that really want to know the same thing. They just won't stand up and ask the question. Thomas said, listen, I, we, we all been around each other for three and a half years, and I know that the other ones, if, if I don't understand, I know they don't understand. So I got a question. Right. One of them is, where are you going? The other one is, uh, if, if, you, if, if you're going, how are we going to follow you? Uh, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Yes. Now, I want to share something with you. While this text brings us a great a deal of comfort and joy as believers, this is one of the most offensive scriptures in the Bible to unbelievers, yes. uh, to a world that, that does not want to embrace absolute truth. This is an offensive scripture. In a nation of religious pluralism, this is an offensive scripture. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody, nobody gets to eternal life. No, nobody has their destination set when they die. Uh, nobody goes to heaven unless they come by me. Now, now you got the right. Uh, with, 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 your, with your mind to, to worship who you want. You can worship cattle, you can worship a cow, you can worship yourself, you can be an atheist, you can be an agnostic, you can legislate religious pluralism all you want. Nobody comes to me unless they come by me through me to get to the Father. I know everybody won't live forever, but Jesus said everybody ain't going to live, well, you're going to live forever, but you got two choices. And the only way you're going to get to heaven is by me. That offends a whole lot of folk. But I want you to know something. Sometimes you got to offend folk to love them. And Jesus was willing to offend in order to express love. He said, listen, I want you to understand, because I want you to get salvation right. I want you, when you preach, to understand, and I'm telling you, you've been with me three and a half years. You are on uh, my discipleship road. But being on my discipleship road ain't going to get you where I'm going. You followed me up to this point. But listen, when I die, you got to believe that I got up. Because otherwise, following me for three and a half years ain't going to get you to where I'm going. Somebody talk to me in this place. He said, nobody comes to the Father except by me. Now, now, what we've done in church, we've taught people that simply coming to church yeah. will get you into heaven. Yeah. Serving in the ministry will get you to heaven. But I want you to know something. A.W. Tozer said this. Uh, A.W. Tozer said that modern religion focuses upon filling churches with people. But the true gospel emphasizes feeling, filling people with God. Amen. I'm going to say that again. A.W. Tozer said, modern religion focuses upon filling churches with people. Amen. But the true gospel emphasizes filling people with God. Amen. Amen. Many of us have a great deal of anxiety about people not being in church, in the pews. Uh, and so all we focus on is filling the pew with people. Amen. Jesus said the way you fill the pew with people Amen. is to fill people with God. If you fill people with God, Jesus said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men unto me. Listen, when you draw all men unto me, you're going to get 
dress up as cute as we want. Oh, yeah. We can put on our Sunday best. We can oh, yeah. clean our cars. We can open the doors. Make sure the lights are on. But if we ain't filled with God, if the presence of the Lord is not in this place, Jesus is going to bar them at the door from coming in. Because he knows the church can't save folks. Only Jesus. So the disciples are answering or asking questions that only Jesus can answer. I want you to understand Christianity, just, just like people in general, uh, we struggle, whether we're Christians or whether we just in the world, we struggle with polarities. Uh, we struggle with, with how to reconcile uh, dual thoughts. Amen. We struggle with it. We, we struggle uh, with, with how to reconcile the idea uh, that on the one hand there's light and on the other hand there's darkness. We, we struggle with the polarities that exist uh, between God being sovereign, okay. but yet we have responsibility. Okay. Uh, we struggle uh, with, with uh, the, the apparent uh, contradiction between uh, there being a good God but yet there's evil and suffering in the world. And so uh, it, it causes uh, us to have a great deal of anxiety because uh, we, we somehow uh, have to reconcile uh, polar opposites in order to make sense of life. I want you to understand psychologically and emotionally for your mental health. Listen, that word anxiety simply means being pulled in two different directions. That's what anxiety is. It means there are polarities that are pulling you in two different directions. And if you're being pulled in two different directions, you'll be pulled apart. Right. And the only way you can deal with that anxiety is to somehow reconcile these polar opposites. Right. But in a nation, in a world that has succumbed to relativism, right. which literally means whatever you believe to be true and right, whatever you believe to be true and right in your own eyes, is what you go with. But if truth is relative, then there is an impossibility of me reconciling this on this hand and this on the other hand. Because if truth is relative, that means I got one person over here telling me that this on the right is true. I got somebody else telling me this on the left is true. And I got somebody else telling me that right in the middle is true. So actually, relativism makes me more messed up at the end than what I was when I started. Am I making any sense to anybody? Uh, we, we struggle with the idea of, of love and hate, these, these polar opposites. But the wonderful thing about Jesus is that Jesus helps us to reconcile the, these polarities. Christianity, my brothers and sisters, struggle with these ideas. The good thing is Jesus, he pulls together these polarities in the same truth. Uh, it says in John chapter 1, uh, that, that the word became flesh, dwelt among us. Uh, and then he goes on to say that he's full of what? He's full of grace and he's full of truth. Uh, Jesus in, in his personhood, Jesus in his essence, helps to reconcile the polar opposites that we struggle with. That's why you've got to be able to answer these questions about Jesus. Because what Jesus does uh, Jesus helps all of us to understand that, that, that we all must have a life with meaning. All right. But here's where Jesus helps us to, to, to deal with some of our polarities. He says, Jesus said, in me you'll understand that, that life is a life of meaning, but it's not a life without tears. All right. Amen. Jesus helps us to deal with that, that anxiety where we, we see good and evil struggling. Uh, but we see those who are evil doing good, and we so see those who are apparently doing good experiencing evil. And, and we, we have a great deal of spiritual tension and anxiety because we can't reconcile that. But Jesus said, in me, you'll know that life has meaning, but it ain't without tears. Somebody else talked to me in this place. Uh, and so uh, Jesus wants us to understand uh, the intrinsic value of his personhood. And it's embedded in the idea of a creator God and a purposeful creation. Jesus offers this. But then Jesus also offers his perfect life to flawed humanity. Jesus helps us to 
deal with the uh, sociological and psychological tension we experience when we see folks who, who are apparently good, no. doing all manner of evil. No. Matter of fact, I saw the other day, uh, there's, there's something morbid about humanity. Where, where they're having to go, matter of fact, they said the other day, uh, they're talking about tearing down Columbine High School. And the reason why they're going to tear it down, we know what happened at that high school. Uh, there are those who want not only to duplicate what happened, it's become a shrine. But, but the state of Colorado is tired of tour buses. I think I need to stop because when I heard that on the news, I said, wait a minute, what are you talking about? No, people actually on their tours want to stop by high school. Well, a bunch of kids and faculty got kids. There's something wrong with that. And only Jesus can help us to understand. Listen, Jesus, first of all, would tell us, listen, ain't none of us good. Uh, all of our righteousness is in silly bags. And so Jesus helps us to understand this tension between good and evil and people who are apparently good and people who are apparently evil by saying, listen, I gave my perfect life for a total humanity that is flawed. Yes. Then Jesus, listen, Jesus wants us to understand that life, a life is a life of harsh physicality. But the triumph is the triumph of the spirit. Yeah. Uh, Jesus, as it relates to this harsh physicality of the triumph of the spirit, says in John 16, 33, in this world, you'll have tribulation. But be of good cheer. He said, I've already overcome the world. I'm helping us deal with some of our tension. Uh, and some of my anxiety, just like the disciples are going through. So the question, my friends, is why do I, or why do you as a believer, why do we believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life? I'm hoping we all believe he's the way, the truth, and the life. And if you don't, I'm praying that before I get through, that the Holy Spirit will help convince you that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Listen, we believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life because of his description of our human condition. We believe Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life because of his description of our human condition. Listen, uh, one of the reasons why folk are offended by John 14 and 6 is because Jesus helps us see our heart in a way that we've never seen it before. We see our heart as this pretty red thing we draw on a piece of paper. Amen? Amen. We see, we see some of the most beautiful hearts Amen. in the world. But Jesus helps us to see that our heart don't look like that. He says, our heart is desperately wicked. And who can know it? And so what Jesus does, he gives us a perfect description of our human condition. Christianity, my brothers and sisters, is the only answer in the world that offers you a savior. Relativism will yield anxiety and uncertainty about evil, about justice, about love, and about forgiveness. Listen, these are four areas in which you don't want relativity. Amen. You don't want relativity when it comes to evil. Amen. You don't want relativity when it comes to justice. Come on, you don't want relativity when it comes to love. And you don't want relativity when it comes to forgiveness. Come you want to know. Am I good or am I bad? You want to know. Am I going to get what I deserve or not? You want to know. Do you love me or not? You want to know. Do you forgive me or not? Listen, in relationships, that whole idea of relativism ain't going to make it. If somebody says, do you love me? You can say, well, what's love? Y'all pray with me. You can't say, well, my definition of love may be different than your definition. How you define love? This is, that ain't gonna, your relationship ain't gonna last long if you don't have some absolute truth about love. And the fact of the matter is, when we look at evil, justice, love, and forgiveness, the only place we see them reconciled is on the cross. At the cross, we see evil, justice, love, and forgiveness all on display. The Bible says God demonstrated His love towards us, and that wow. But yet sinners, Christ died for us. In Jesus, we see that Christ equips us for suffering. 
First way he equips us with suffering, he tells the disciples, after he tells them, I'm going away, I'm preparing a mansion, they say, we don't know the way, we don't know how to get there. He said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to give you a tour guide. I'm going to go away instead. All right. I'm going to physically go away, but I'm going to send my spirit. Come on. And he will lead you into all yes. truth. He will help show you the way. Yes. So, so but what he does is he equips us in suffering by saying, I'm going to be with you. All right. He equips us in suffering by saying, I'll never leave you, nor will I forsake you. Amen. He equips us in suffering by letting us know that when you have answers, if you come to me, all right. When you're weary and late, heavy late, he has said, I will give you rest. I'll give you rest from your worries, rest from your anxiety. Listen, Jesus provides a malady, my brothers and sisters, for our sin. There are basically three classes of people in our world. There's what is called the existentialist. That's the person who lives for the moment. All right. Then there's the traditionalist. The traditionalist lives only for the past. All right. But then there's the utopianist who only lives for the future. Mm. And, and so you got three categories of folk outside of Christ. Uh, some live for the present. Mm. Some live for the past. Mm. Some live for the future. Mm. But Jesus is the only one mm. who can help you live in the past, yeah. present. Yeah. I'm going to get happy all by myself. <laughs> he said, I am the, I, I am the same yesterday, yeah. today. Yeah.
even though the law says you can do it, is because there is a convicting power in your heart. Listen, my brothers and sisters, Jesus is dead. My friends, is the answer to sin. And I want us to understand, my brothers and sisters, that the only place we see evil, justice, forgiveness, and love converge at one point is on the cross of Christ. Amen. If you're struggling with the issue of evil on behalf of others, mm. more importantly, if you're struggling with your own Amen. evil, Amen. the fact of the matter is Jesus shows us our own human condition. And when we find ourselves just like Jesus says, and we want to give up, and we're experiencing anxiety, Jesus steps in and says, listen, I am the way. When we have a need for forgiveness, on, and we realize we've been as bad as we want to be, and we still feel the guilt and shame of being bad, Jesus said, listen, I'm also the truth. Right. Uh, when we struggle with justice, and wonder uh, if is right ever going to be on the throne, and if evil ever going to be dealt with, uh, Jesus said, I'm also the light. I want us to understand, my brothers and sisters, I ain't got nothing fancy to tell you. But Jesus is still the answer for the world today. And he's the answer for your heart. He's the answer for your life. And if you're dealing with the anxiety of not knowing how to deal with the polarities in life, understand that Jesus will reconcile the polarities. That's what it means when he says he'll make the wounded whole. If you want to be made whole, yeah. you got to come to Jesus. Yeah. If you want to be made right, yeah. you got to come to Jesus. Yeah. If you want your mind regulated, your heart fixed, yeah. you got to come to Jesus. Yeah. Answering questions about Jesus. Yeah. Simon said, Lord, we want to go, but we don't know the way. We don't know how to get there. Later on, Paul helped us out. Paul said, if you simply open your mouth, All right. Confess with your mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God is the way, the truth, and the life. You shall be saved. As I extend the invitation to become a follower of the Lord, you may have answers about Jesus. And if you, if you have questions, excuse me, about Jesus, we want you, first of all, to not be ashamed to come and say, listen, I'm not ready to be saved, but I do have some questions about Jesus. And we'd love to be able to answer those questions for you. But maybe you've been wrestling with the question right here in service. And Jesus has impressed upon your heart that he's the answer. We want you to come forward, not be ashamed. Give us your hand. Allow us to lead you to that walk of faith with Christ. But then if you are redeemed and saved and you already know it, we want to welcome you into not the kingdom of God because you're already there, but into our local church family if you're in need of a church home. So as we stand all over the building, 